Welcome back. This is the first of two videos on economic and social welfare policy. Um, in the first, in this one, <clears throat> we're going to cover what is public policy, what we mean by it. Um, that is, you know, those of us who study political science uh, often study public policy as a separate subject. And in last week's um, video, we talked about civil rights and liberties, and that is a policy area. Um, so is economic policy. So is uh, social welfare policy, and so is foreign policy, which is our uh, what we'll, we'll cover next week. So in this video, this one, we'll cover what is public policy, and then we'll talk about economic policy, meaning such things as um, the concept of a political economy, an economy that is um, enmeshed with the political system, and in part regulated by it, but also influenced by it. And, and then we'll talk about uh, the goals of economic policy, the things that our federal government does to influence the way the economy operates. We'll talk about what those tools are and different theories of how to do it that, that really have a lot to do with um, Republicans and Democrats having different ideas of how to um, handle economic policy. And that will take us through the end of this video. That's part one. Part two is the one on social welfare policy. So the second video for this week is just about social welfare policy. Now, uh, and that means social insurance programs like Social Security and, and Medicare, and also what we call means-tested programs, which is aid uh, for those who, who don't have much. In other words, programs that are only available to the poor. And um, in, in that one, we'll also talk about what social welfare policy is, where it comes from, and a bit of comparative analysis of where the U.S. stands uh, in comparison with other countries. So, here we go. What is public policy? Well, when we say public policy, we are talking about a course of action. In other words, it isn't just uh, one decision. It is a course of action. And it, 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 it is a, a purposeful effort by the government to accomplish something. And uh, so it has goals. It has objectives. And we think of public policy, usually when we think of it, as, as being um, part of a process that has certain characteristics. So um, for us, as for people who study political science, the policy process is a bit like a cycle. And it, it goes like this. If you, if you look at the top uh, uh, there, you'll see um, it says problem identification. And that's the first thing that's the first stage in the policy process when we conceive of it as a cycle. That is, a problem comes to the attention of government. It might come to their attention in many different ways. Maybe the news media, maybe science, you know, um, such as uh, global warming. This, is, this comes to us from science. They say, wait, we have a problem. Or it, it may be something that policymakers like members of Congress or the president have already had in mind as a problem, something they're concerned about. But whatever it is... Um, you know, it could be uh, the, the, a, an oncoming hurricane. It could be um, poverty. It could be inequality. It could be um, a government surplus that they don't know how to spend. Any number of things. These are just problems that are identified. At any given time, there are just many, many, many possible things that government could pay attention to. And the next question is, which ones? You know, which ones do you attend to first? And that process of prioritizing things and deciding which things to really act on, we call agenda setting. So it's a bit like you go to, if you went to a meeting and had an agenda, these are the things we're going to do. We're not going to do everything. We're going to do these things. That's, the government has, in essence, its agenda at any given time. And you know, if Republicans are in control, the agenda will be different than when Democrats are in control. They have different priorities. Um, and the next step after agenda setting is to take a given policy problem and come up with some sort of a policy or a solution or approach to dealing with it. And we call that policy formulation. And often there are two, three, four, five different competing ways to address the problem. And then, of course, you know, if, if it's going to go further, one of, one of those uh, alternatives has to be adopted. And that's what we call policy adoption. And, after it's, and that would mean the vote in Congress and the signature by the president, if we're talking about a federal policy. Next stage after that is putting it into practice, where we call that policy implementation. And that's where the policy goes into the bureaucracy and has to get turned into action. So, you know, for example, if, if the idea is to do something about uh, air quality, and that's the, that's the problem, 
it makes its way up the agenda. And when the time comes to deal with it, there's an approach that comes out. They consider different ways to try to improve air quality. And um, one of them is adopted. One of these approaches is adopted. Say, for example, carbon credits. Now, this is an approach that, that is a kind of a supply side or economics approach to the issue where they allow businesses to emit certain amounts of pollutants or carbon in this case. Uh, in, in the case of global warming, they worry about carbon, CO2, carbon dioxide. <clears throat> and and they're allowed a certain amount. And if they go over that uh, amount, they want to pollute more than that, they have to buy the credits that allow them to do it. And another company that doesn't need to put out as many pollutants, doesn't need uh, their full allowance, they can actually sell their credits so to another company that wants to pollute more. All right, so that policy then has to be implemented, doesn't it? If that's the policy solution, it goes down into the Environmental Protection Agency, it gets turned into regulations, it gets sent out to field offices, notices get sent to businesses, and it gets processed through the system, implemented. Now, then normally the next stage after that is policy evaluation, where um, bureaucrats, you say, in this case, in the Environmental Protection Agency, look at the outcome. They say, well, how well is this working? and they study it using data. That's called policy evaluation, right? Now, uh, the next step after that is, uh, look, where it goes back again to identification because the, the evaluation of the policy <clears throat> leads to the start of the cycle again. If it's not working well, you have another problem. And so the same policy can go through multiple cycles of problem identification, agenda setting, formulation, adoption, implementation, and evaluation. And evaluation can then lead to the cycle starting all over again. What do we need to do next? So that's the idea. Um, that's a cycle. Um, Theodore Lowy, who was a very famous political scientist, said there are really four types of public policies. One is what we call promotional policy, where the government, it's a, it's a different approach. It's like what you call, you've heard of the carrot and the stick approach, where the carrot is a reward, the stick is a punishment. Well. Promotional policy is where the government rewards people for doing things that the government wants them to do. Uh, for example, um, subsidies uh, and grants, where the government literally subsidizes money or gives them tax cuts for doing them. Um, it's for example, subsidizing right now, there are some government grants available, and they have been in the past, for putting in new furnaces in your house that are more energy efficient. Maybe you get to have a tax credit if you do that. You get to take some money off your taxes. Maybe you get to deduct from your taxes some of the cost of doing it. Maybe cities are, are encouraged to clean up their water. The government gives them money to help them clean their water. These are grants and subsidies and tax cuts. Another way government can uh, get people to do things, another type of policy, is regulatory policy. That's where you tell people not to do things and you punish them if they do. Um, you penalize people for doing things that we don't want them to do. Taxing cigarettes and, and alcohol those are called sin taxes. It's kind of, it's not, I'm not saying it's a sin, but it's a, it's a term that is used for when the government taxes things that they would rather we didn't do. You can also fine people. You can even put them in jail. These are all regulatory policies for different types of things. Anything that involves a punishment is a regulatory policy. Then there are the things uh, uh, that we call redistributive policy. And this is very much what we're going to talk about when we cover economic policy changing the tax code, raising or lowering interest rates, any other rules that affect large groups of people, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of us. Those are redistributive policies that tend to, uh, uh, like when they change the tax code, if they give rich people a tax cut, that increases the tax burden on those lower down, probably, or it results in, in less government services. So those are redist uh, redistributive policies because they redistribute uh, the costs and benefits of government. And the final type of policy is constituent policy. That means when the government reorganizes itself. Best example I can think of is the creation of the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11. They created a whole new government department. That, was, that went through the policy cycle very quickly too. So now let's jump right into economic policy, okay? Um, <clears throat> First, uh, I, I like this cartoon because it shows the economy as sort of this black box that nobody can understand. Everyone's confused about it. I think that is the way many of us feel. It is a very complicated subject. I don't expect you to be economists in any way, but you know we'll go over some of the, um, the key things 
that uh, government is concerned about when they make economic policy, which doesn't require us to be economists. First, we, we use the term in political science <coughs> and uh, elsewhere, political economy. And this reflects um, our understanding that there's a mythology that somehow the economy is separate from government. There's the economy over here, there's the government over there. Okay, that's a myth. That's not true. Um, people like to say there was a, there used to be or should be a, quote, free market where individuals engage in transactions and the government isn't involved. That, okay, in reality, that has never even existed in all of human history. There is no such thing as a free market and it never has been. Certainly not under capitalism, never, ever. What we have always had is a political economy where governments create the conditions that make economic activity possible. That is one of the major functions of government, in fact, is to create conditions that make economic activity possible, uh, such as public safety, um, preventing people from stealing from each other. So they have to buy things. Why would anyone buy anything if you could just steal it? Well, this is a, a thing government does that makes e economic transactions possible. Uh, making and enforcing laws of contract creating courts where contracts can be enforced, uh, creating money, governments create money, uh, public education that enables people to meaningfully work, uh, to, to perform tasks for which they are trained, making sure people can read, write, do arithmetic. Well, government does that for the most part. Uh, transportation systems so we can get to work. And I mentioned, you know, subsidies and tax policies. And then the all-important public works or the creation of public infrastructure. I mean, roads, sewer systems, uh, water systems, electrical systems, all these things are either created by or subsidized by or regulated by government. And we couldn't have a so-called free market if we didn't have all of those things, could we? We couldn't even get to work if the government didn't build roads for us. Um, and by the way, when people think that private companies can do all this. You know what? We tried that. Uh, in the early 1800s, um, there were a lot of efforts to, for private companies to build roads and canals and this sort of thing. And ultimately, governments had to take those things over because the private capital just simply wasn't there to do it. And, you know, my area of research is privatization. That is the thing that I write the most about and study the most. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it just is a fact that all these private efforts to do what government does for us today failed. And that's why government took those things over. Uh, private capital and private enterprise and the incentives that operate on them were simply inadequate. And so, you know, there was no private company that was going to build the interstate highway system. So the federal government did it in the 1950s. And without the interstate highway system, you wouldn't be able to drive you know, from between big cities uh, without spending days on the road. And that's, that's why it was done. But there was no private company that was going to build that, the interstate highway system. Well, that's essential to commerce. Drive on any interstate highway, 80, 90, pick the one you want. It's, it's covered with trucks, right? <clears throat> what are the trucks doing? Commerce. So just understand the government, we don't have a free market. We have a political economy. <clears throat> That's the way it is now, and that is the way it always has been. Um, <clears throat> historically, if we go back to the, I'm, I'm, I'm now looking through all of modern times, you know, uh, I'm not really speaking about the way economic transactions worked, say, before the 1500s. <clears throat> this is the really history of capitalism. <clears throat> it emerged from mercantilism in the 1500s and on, where European governments uh, encouraged exports, discouraged imports, and tried to <clears throat> massively increase their holdings of gold and silver bullion. They, they sponsored big trading companies like the uh, Dutch and the English East uh, India companies that went around the world and um, appropriated or stole, if you want, uh, resources from uh, other countries in, in Asia and in, in other parts of the world as well. And, and explored and wanted to bring back gold, et cetera. You've heard the age of exploration and all this. Well, that was sponsored by governments. So there was not a free market. It was these, these things were sponsored by, regulated by, chartered by government. And they helped organize private capital to do those things. Uh, then in the, the next stage is uh, laissez-faire capitalism. <clears throat> and that is the U United States, really, in the 19th century, the 1800s. Right to a time maybe World War I, where we saw minimal regulation, there, uh, but a lot of promotion. That is, best example is land. I mean, the federal government was acquiring 
uh, which you could also call appropriating or stealing land from um, the uh, indigenous population and from Mexico. And they were essentially giving that land for free to businesses or for very, very low cost and protecting it, the military and subsidizing the creation of railroads and so forth to make it all usable. So what we call laissez-faire capitalism was really a time of uh, promotion, massive pro government promotion of uh, private fortunes, which gave us a booming um, but unregulated economy by the end of the 1800s. At the same time, in the late 1800s, you see the emergence of socialism uh, through the tw much of the 20th century in the former Soviet Union, China, Cuba, etc. Uh, and, and in socialism, you have government ownership of the major means of production, you know, the factories, the mines, the agricultural land. Um, and this uh, unwound, um, or in the case of um, so former Soviet Union, the country basically fell apart. And what emerged was, from that was Russia in their attempt to privatize in a big hurry. Uh, everything, it was a catastrophe. And Russia became um, a, a basket case, an economic basket case that it still is to this day. In the United States, we, from the 1930s on, evolved what we sometimes call a mixed economy, um, a, a, a form of regulated capitalism. There's substantial government regulation of the economy, but we still have private ownership of the means of production, uh, you know, the, the lands and the uh, factories uh, the, and so forth. It's owned the mines and the, the places where the cattle graze and all this. Almost all this is, is owned or leased by private parties. But the government regulates the conditions, as you'll see. What, that's what we're going to talk about. That's basically the, what we have is a form of regulated uh, capitalism. <clears throat> And from 1978 to the present, we have been in an era that we sometimes call the neoliberal era, where many people, particularly um, Republicans and conservative Democrats, have wanted to return to something closer to laissez-faire capitalism, which involves cutting taxes, cutting government regulations, and cutting social welfare expenditures. Um, and uh, that's the stage we're in now. There are, there's kind of a battle going on right now in Washington, um, for, or at least for the last few years. Democrats have favored more the mixed economy approach, and re Republicans have been more inclined toward trying to push back toward the laissez-faire era. I don't know that anyone thinks you can actually recreate a, you know, a past era of regulation, but uh, they favor less government regulation, lower taxes, and lower social welfare expenditures, whereas Democrats typically want higher taxes on the wealthy, more government regulation, and higher social welfare expenditures. And that's kind of the where, where we stand right now. And we're in a, uh, an era of a lot of ideological combat over this. There was, after World War II for a long time, kind of a consensus about that. Uh, uh, there was a lot of consensus in Washington about how to do things with the economy, but that's really broken up. As I said, you know, the Democratic Party um, advocates for different types of policies. Um, progressive taxation, meaning taxing the rich more than others. Uh, regulating corporations, um, trying to reduce inequality, and uh, in establishing universal uh, health care coverage, universal health insurance or health care. Whereas the Republicans want more to move back toward the laissez-faire capitalism of the 1800s. They want to cut taxes on the rich. They don't like unions. Um, they uh, want to privatize a lot of government functions, deregulate the economy, get rid of consumer protection laws, labor relations laws, environmental protections laws. They want, they've said they want to repeal the Af Affordable Care Act <clears throat> and privatize or eliminate Social Security and Medicare. So those would take, if they had their way, that would take us back to something like the uh, 1800s or the early 20th century. So now let's go through some of the key concepts and terms that we, we need to know about. <clears throat> because uh, I'll use these terms. One, gross domestic product, GDP. That is the measure of how fast our, a national economy is growing, like ours, the U.S. GDP. Um, that's a rate. So uh, it's measured like a percentage. So like a 4% GDP means a 4% rate of increase that, it, that the economy at the end of the year will be 4% bigger than it was at the start of the year. A 5% Growth in GDP means the economy at the end of the year is 5%. Now, sometimes they measure this by quarter, um, but, but they're still annualizing the rate. So the, the growth rate might be 3% for the first quarter of the year, 5% for the second quarter, 
etc. But those rates are uh, projections of what the annual uh, growth rate will be at any given time. You can take a snapshot over a month or a quarter, but what they're talking about is uh, the annual rate of increase of the economy. <clears throat> so the, a recession is when you have negative GDP growth. In other words, it, the economy shrinks for two consecutive quarters. That would be six months. If, it, if, it, if the economy shrinks for six months, we say we're in a recession. And then when they use the term boom, expansion, or recovery, that means the economy is growing, not shrinking. Um, inflation, which we're hearing a lot about um, from bankers, is when prices and wages go up throughout the economy. It basically means that money is worth less than uh, uh, over the course of the year. The money becomes worth less in, uh, you can has less buying power, you see what I mean. Um, if, if a loaf of bread costs $3, and then at the end of the year, it costs four dollars. That means your money your money buys less. Now, if if only one thing goes up in value, say bread, because wheat is becomes more expensive, that's not really a sign of inflation. But if everything goes up, that in in prices, and if wages go up, then we call that inflation. That is where the money is becoming worth less, and a certain inflation rate is considered okay. Um, a huge inflation rate is considered a bad thing. Government tries to avoid it. The Federal Reserve, when we say the Federal Reserve, we're talking about the, uh, the United States central banking system. It is actually private banks, but they're regulated uh, by the uh, federal government. Down, in downtown Chicago, there's one of the major Federal Reserve branches. Uh, they're in other cities as well, St. Louis, New York, uh, San Francisco, etc., these are big, large central banks, and all the other banks in the country are able to borrow money from these big central banks at extremely low interest rates, and then they can lend it to us at higher interest rates, and thereby banks can make profit. Deficit versus debt. A deficit is uh, the positive or negative uh, am amount by which the government uh, ends up at the end of the year. So if, if the government takes in less in tax revenues than it spends. In other words, it spends more than it took in. We call it a budget deficit. Debt means all the deficits added together. How much money does the federal government actually owe total? We're going to talk about that. So those are the key terms. Now, uh, these terms then relate to the goals of, of um, economic policy. Governments, the federal government, tries to influence the, the economy. So we have a stable growth of the GDP of 3 to 4%. They want unemployment to be less, the unemployment rate to be less than 5%. But they don't want it to go to zero. They want a, an unemployment rate because they want a reserve of employees that will be available to be hired if business needs more. Um, they, and they also don't want wages to go up. If, if, employ, if the unemployment rate gets really low, 1% or less or something, Wages start going up because you have to pay people more to get there's too many jobs. Uh, so this is from a banker's perspective, at least. And so uh, that leads to wages going up. And then the wages going up, that can lead to inflation. Now, they want to keep the inflation rate below 3%. Usually it is. Sometimes it's very low, uh, but it can go higher. And that's a thing that they try to regulate by regulating the money supply. They want the poverty rate to be low. We'll talk about what it is. Um, they want... Uh, trade deficits that are relatively low, meaning the, the trade relations between, let's say, China and the U.S., uh, what's happening there? Are we se Who's selling more to which country? And, and you probably know the answer. China sells us more than we sell them. But there are other countries where it's the other way around, where, where the U.S. sells more to, let's say, Canada than Canada sells to us. These are major trading partners. Well, those a tra when they use the term trade deficit, that means uh, it's not a budget deficit. The, the same amount, we've, we've given them money, they've given us goods. It's, it's, there's no real deficit. But, but what they mean by that is that one country is selling more than uh, to, to, like, say, China is selling more to us in terms of goods, and we're giving them money. Then we are selling them in goods, and they are sending us in money. Now, these are, some economists say the trade deficits are not a problem. We shouldn't even worry about them that if we need to buy something like electronics from another country rather than make it, and they and other countries want to buy things from us, fine, who cares? But uh, it, we shouldn't worry about it. Other people think that um, countries should make more of what they use and should not run big trade deficits because it means they're dependent 
on other countries. So that, for example, we are dependent on China for a lot of, and Korea and, uh, and Taiwan for a lot of our electronics. Well, is that a bad thing? I don't know. Uh, we give them money, they give us electronics. Is that a bad thing? Uh, other countries, um, like for example, Germany is very dependent or has been very dependent for years on uh, Russia for, um, uh, for gas and oil. Well, they don't produce it domestically. Germany doesn't have a lot of gas and oil. They have to buy it from someplace. And so normally buying these things isn't a big problem, but it can lead to political dependency where it gets difficult for countries to take independent positions uh, because of their economic relationships. They may want to criticize something another country did, but they don't feel they can say it because they have an economic relationship with that country. So understand that's why I say the economics and the politics are always very closely related. Uh, depending upon which parties in power, if Republicans are in power, they don't care about much about environmental issues and sustainability and global warming. They say they don't believe it exists and so forth. When Democrats are in power, environmental issues take some sort of priority. Um, so that becomes a goal. And then sometimes government wants to promote particular industries. One favorite, of course, is the U.S. auto industry. And we call that industrial policy when, a, when a, the federal government is trying to help a particular industry one way or another. And there are many ways they can do that. And a new issue that has become very important, at least for um, some people in the Democratic Party, not so much for Republicans, is in, uh, increasing inequality. Um, the, many politicians, particularly Democrats, believe that increasing inequality is destabilizing our society and the political system. Other people think it's natural. More of a laissez-faire approach says, well, inequality is natural and we shouldn't worry about it. Um, but I, I think many governments around the world feel that the problem with inequality is that it leads to um, political instability. Uh, you end up with, instead of, say, parties that represent a big middle class, you end up with parties that represent the rich and parties that represent the poor, and that can be very destabilizing. That's the concern. Um, current challenges of economic policy. Um, well, the economy was doing pretty well before COVID hit. Uh, we had low inflation, low unemployment. The COVID disrupted everything. We had steady economic growth. Um, the, uh, the stock market, which is a one measure of the economy, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was gigantic, over 30,000 up to 35,000. But if you look at it other ways, there were a lot of challenges. And one of those is, as I mentioned, inequality, which has been increasing since 1980. I'm going to show you some graphs on that, um, which I think, and I think the I mentioned that some people disagree with this. You can believe whatever you want, but um, my view of it in, is that... Um, Increasing inequality leads to uh, political instability and, and conflict. So, yeah, and when, when Trump was president, they cut taxes on the rich again. Um, problem there is it leads to increased budget deficits because the federal government can't take in as much money if you cut taxes on the rich. Um, the cost of health care is another challenge. Um, individuals, employers, and governments, uh, you know, are always concerned about the cost of health care for their for themselves, their families, and their employees. Um, uh, it needs work, and Republicans are blocking the policies that are aimed at solving this. Um, they say they have other solutions that they want to propose, and it's unclear what those solutions are because uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, that was passed when Obama was president was a Republican idea. It was invented in the Conservative Heritage uh, Foundation, and uh, Mitt Romney, the Republican governor of Massachusetts at the time, enacted it in Massachusetts, basically the the precursor to the Affordable Care Act was Romney Care, as they called it. Uh, it's a Republican idea. And so now when Republicans say they don't like it because Democrats adopted it as their idea. Um, but they haven't been able to, Republicans have not been able to come up with, a, with an alternative, and we'll have to see if, that, if they do or not. But health care costs are a very big deal. And <clears throat> demographic trends uh, suggest that we, we need to plan for spending a lot more on healthcare because of the aging of the baby boom generation. And that's not really a problem that we're solving yet. So that has to be attended to. And then another major issue is global warming, uh, which, which is going to require fundamental changes in the way our economy works. And we are not addressing that in this country now. Some countries uh, in Europe, they are attempting to address it. China is definitely attempting to address it. Uh, the U.S. is not at this point. So let's look at some of the data. When I... Uh, I this goes back 1948 to 2013. This is a, um, a study. 
And it shows that, um, and I won't expect you to understand every aspect of this, but just understand that that dark blue line is the productivity of the economy, the growth in the, in the domestic product, the value of the goods and services that our economy was producing. It's growing and growing and growing, right? And the light blue line is wages, the real wages that people were receiving. And if you look at this, you can see that as productivity went up from after World War II through the early, the mid 1970s, when productivity went up, wages went up. So what that means is the value of what we're producing, if you're working in a factory, let's say, the value of what you're, we were producing was going up and up and up and up and up. Technology was making it more valuable. Uh, work became more productive. And, and workers continued to get their wages increased because as the pie got bigger, they got more. But what happened starting in the mid-70s was productivity shot up and wages stayed the same. Wages, real wages, you know, discounted for the value of inflation. Real wages are hardly higher than they were in the 1970s. As you'll see, in, in some respects, they've gone down. So where did all that extra productivity, meaning wealth, go? Well, it went to the rich. And that is what, what has happened, that <clears throat> we have had massive increases in inequality. In the 50s, uh, a, chief, a chief executive officer typically made 20 times the salary of the average worker, but, you know, it's now more like 361 times or 400 times um, more. Uh, it doesn't make any difference, you know, what, uh, the, how productive the company is. The extra wealth is going to the executives and to the stockholders. It is not going to the employees. To the employees. And this uh, shows up. Now, this is from a study, a book, a series of studies by Thomas Piketty, who is a, a well-known author, wrote a book about capitalism recently. But anyway, and you can see that if we went through the 20th century up in the 21st century, you can see this is the top 10% share of the income in the country. So let's say the top, if we went to the peak just in the 1929, that's before the crash of the economy, the Great Depression of 1929, uh, that the top 10% of the income distribution were getting 50% of the income. Now, then we have the crash of the economy, and then we have the New Deal era, and we, which I've talked about, you know, the 40s, the 50s, the growth of the American middle class, and the, the top 10% of the income distribution were only getting by then about a third, as opposed to half of all the money coming in every year. But look what's happened in the 70s. Again, this is the neoliberal era, the 70s, and it starts to go back up again. And now where are we? We're right where we were before the Great Depression, where the top 10% of the population in income are getting half of the income that is generated in this country every year. In the top one, uh, uh, one tenth of one percent, check them out. You see where they are? These are the super rich. They are just this tiny little sliver at the same heights they were in, before the Great Depression, which is you know, 10, 12 percent of the income. Uh, that's this tiny little sliver of the super rich getting this, this amazing amount of money. Now, here's another way to look at it. This is from the Pew Research Center, and it goes from 1970 to 2018. Uh, and I'm going to you can look at both sides of this. I'm just going to focus on this. this. Look at the one on the right, share of U.S. aggregate income, okay? Now, the, that, that yellow line back in 1970 that was the highest, that was the middle income, the middle class. The next line down the dark green line was the rich, and the bottom line, the pale green line, is the poor. So we have the middle class, the upper class, and the poor, right? Well, back in 1970, the middle income got 62%. The middle class got 62% of the wealth of the total aggregate income every year, the income. The upper class, 29%, and the poor, 10%. Look where we are now. The upper income have shot up. 48%. They're getting half, like the other graph showed. They're getting half the income every year, the rich. Middle class has dropped back. The middle class is getting less wealth, which also means, in essence, there are fewer mem members of the middle class. And the poor are doing a little bit less well than they were, uh, you know, 50 years ago. So this is what's been happening when I say growing inequality. And this has political consequences for the Democratic and Republican parties, as you can imagine. This is wealth. Now, wealth, that's accumulation of income over years. And so, you know, you can just see, again, the same thing. 
the top 10% of the income distribution have, you know, almost 68, 62, 63% of the wealth. Uh, the people in the middle class have maybe 10% of it and the bottom 50%, the bottom half of the income distribution basically have no family wealth. Uh, here's the richest people in the world, uh, right currently um, Elon Musk, and you can see that he's worth something like $212 billion. Um, you go down to number 10, uh, the 10th richest person is only worth $90 billion. Uh, you know, this is um, what we're talking about when we talk about inequality. And this leads to all kinds of bizarre um, situations where these fabulously wealthy people can can purchase things like well, Jeff Bezos, number two, uh, his basically purchasing the Washington Post and, and uh, Elon Musk wanting to purchase, you know, ma major social media platforms like Twitter and this sort of thing, where wealthy people can influence so many things. They have such disposable income, they can influence almost everything that we see in here. Now, this is just, you know, by comparison, let's look at the minimum wage. Minimum wage, right? Um, you can see back in you know, the, the dark, uh, what we have here is, is two lines, <clears throat> two graphs. One is the um, actual purchasing power. So the, um, if, if you look at the, the dark line, that's what the in, in nominal dollars, in other words, let's say in, in 1940, it was below a dollar. But the, the, the light purple, that is what the actual, that is if you equalize it out to the value of a dollar in 2019. So that top one is the actual value. Now, the, uh, you know, it's what you can really buy with the minimum wage. So if right now, if you look at the dark blue, that's what it really is. We have not raised the minimum wage since 2009. And that's a long, long time to go without raising the minimum wage. As you can see, if you look at it, there have been very few periods of this long a period of time without raising the minimum wage, which is a little over $7. But what does it really buy? Well, look, back in, back in before 1970, the late 60s, the minimum wage was the equivalent in, in, in 2019 dollars of $12 an hour. Well, right now it's the equivalent of $7 an hour because that's what it's equalized at, $2019, right? So um, the value, as you can see, the value of a minimum wage has gone down, 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 down. What you can actually buy with a minimum wage, and we need, and it, this is why people have been saying raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour to get people back up so they'd have some purchasing power that would be just equivalent to what it used to be when you earned the minimum wage. So while the wealthy have been reaping massive benefits from increased productivity uh, due to you know, technology, they've been reaping it and putting it in their pockets. And the middle class has been shrinking and poor people are getting nowhere and people on a minimum wage, their, their money's worth less and less every year. And for some reason, it's controversial in Washington to talk about raising the minimum wage. Now, uh, this is a, what I'm gonna talk about now it has to do with the um, business cycle. And this is, I, I don't expect you to become experts on this. I just want you to understand what government tries to do. Um, the, this, this little sine wave thing that you see here, you see the big sweeps here. This is what happens with an unregulated economy. You know, watch as, as the growth rate goes up and up and up and all, there's the wealth and then suddenly it goes down, down, down. You have prosperity then it goes down to depression and then prosperity. That was the laissez-faire economy. That's the way it used to be. Uh, boom and bust cycles. Now, if you look at the at the much lower wave, you see in the middle where it'll say recovery and then recession. This is what the goals of government uh, economic policy are: is to produce that nice, uh, the slight, the slight increases in prosperity and then the slight reductions and the minor recessions. No boom periods, no depressions, just slight up and down in the growth rate. And that's what the government's trying to do. They're trying to moderate the natural up ebbs and flows of a capitalist economy. Those are the goals. So here's another one, uh, basically saying, left to its own devices, that you get booms and busts. But, and that's what we had. But since the 1930s, the federal government has tried to moderate the ups and the downs. So how do they do this? As two types of tools, one involving the money supply, which we call monetary tools or monetary policy. The Federal Reserve sets the lowest interest rates in the U.S. economy. That are, those are the rates at which the biggest banks can borrow from the Federal Reserve. Well, the Federal Reserve can raise or lower those rates to make money more or less expensive, and that affects how much borrowing we do. Raise interest rates, people don't borrow. There's less money in the economy because people aren't borrowing money. Um, 
if they lower interest rates, there's, it's easy money. It's easy. You can borrow money cheap. Uh, then people take out loans. They start businesses. They buy houses, etc. Lots of economic activity. The economy grows. Well, that, this is the sort of thing the government can do with monetary supply, mon the money supply, monetary tools. Fiscal tools means raising and lowering taxes, increasing and decreasing government spending, and increasing and decreasing government borrowing. All these tools influence the growth rate and the shrinking rate of the economy. Um, there are a number of agencies that are involved. The Federal Reserve is extremely important, the Securities and Exchange Commission. The President has the Office of Management and Budget. The Congress has the Congressional Budget Office, uh, et cetera. And there are many other economic regulatory agencies through which this is done. Now, I want to show you a few pictures here. First, this is the lowest interest rate. This is that Federal Reserve. It's called the Federal Funds Effective Rate. It is the lowest rate at which banks can borrow money from the Federal Reserve. And you can see these gray vertical lines, those are recessions. All those gray vertical bands, that's when the economy was in recession. And what you will see whenever there's a recession, you see what happened? The, the uh, rate, which is over here on the left, the, in, the interest rate that is being charged by the Fed goes down. They make it easier for, to borrow money. Why? To stimulate the economy. So look at the horrible recession we had in 08, uh, 20, oh, that was the, the so-called Great Recession. You see that band? Now notice they dropped the rates to almost zero. And then they just started raising them again just before COVID hit. And then they dropped them back to almost zero again. And that's what they do to stimulate economic activity. However, understand when they do that, they risk creating inflation. Now let's go to a close-up. This is the same chart, but it just goes back uh, just a few years, just, the la just like five years. And you can see that band is what happened when COVID started. You see how they dropped the rate to nearly zero and they just started jacking. They just start them jacking up again in uh, 2022. So this is just a picture. This is what they do. This is a picture of what the Federal Reserve does. They control these interest rates and they do it to stimulate economic activity or slow down economic activity. Now, why would you want to slow down economic activity? Answer is because of inflation. Inflation is considered a bad thing, especially by bankers. That means there's prices are going up and consequently wages have to go up. And all prices and wages start going up throughout the economy. So what that amounts to is every dollar you have buys less. And in, you know, theoretically, the dollar could be worth so little that you know, you'd have to you know, spend $100 to buy a loaf of bread. The dollar becomes less valuable. And there are countries around the world where that has happened. Uh, bankers don't like inflation and they try to control it because their loans are paid back when they lend you money the money you pay it back with is worth less. So like if we have a, an inflation rate of 5%, you know, every year, at the end of the year, the dollars are worth less. If they lend you money in January and you pay it back in December, it's worth 5% less and they're, they're losing money on the loan. So they'd have to charge you 6% on that loan and then they'd only make 1%. So um, the point, understand, bankers don't like inflation. And this is why the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to combat inflation. And that's why they will do it every time. As soon as they start to see inflation, they'll try to stop it by raising interest rates. So these are what we call counter cyclical policies. The government pushes back against whatever the, the economic cycle is doing. In a recession or a slowdown, let's put money into the economy, cut taxes, increase government spending, increase government borrowing. Very popular with people. If you have inflation, too much of a boom, raise taxes, decrease government spending, decrease government borrowing, but that's not popular. And so often there's a tendency to not do that, but the Federal Reserve is merciless and they will do it. Now many, I promise we talk a bit about theories of economic policy, and this is what, that's what this is, these number of theories. Um, John Stuart Mill, the famous utilitarian, and Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarians, uh, Adam Smith, free market economics, uh, Karl Marx, communism, and Scrooge McDuck, who you may have seen swimming in pools of his own money. Um, but the main uh, school of thought that guided us throughout the New Deal era from the 30s to the, and, and largely to today, and, and with some disagreement, is Keynesian economics. This is John Maynard Keynes. And he said, the focus of government policy should be on the demand side, consumption, in other words, on us on putting money in our pockets so we can buy stuff. He said that's the key. And he's the, the one who said we should engage in deficit spending. Government should borrow money if necessary to stimulate the economy, put money in consumers' pockets so they can buy things.
buy things. That will lead to businesses producing things. They will hire employees. They will put out more output because we're buying more and that will stimulate the economy. On the other hand, there's a more conservative approach, which is monetarism and let's say fair economics. Here's Milton Friedman of the University of Chicago. He said, no, we shouldn't do any of that stuff. You know, don't try to regulate um, interest rates. I mean, I'd regulate only interest rates and don't engage in deficit spending at all. Um, and just influence the money supply, just interest rates and don't do anything else. That's all he thought should be done. That's called monetarism. And R Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan and uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of the UK were big supporters of that approach. And then there was a thing called supply-side economics. And I, I, this is a, a much more right-wing uh, theory associated with libertarians. And their idea, without, I don't expect you to become a genius on this, but uh, Arthur Laffer and Jude Wanisky, particularly Arthur Laffer, it's called the Laffer Curve. He was a, an economist at the University of Southern California and he said that um, there is a point where tax rates become so high that they stop economic activity. And so his view was that uh, the, the, the Laffer curve shows this, that you can increase tax rates to a certain point, And then after that, they become counterproductive and they squelch economic activity. Uh, not everybody believes that, but that was a theory that was popular uh, during the Reagan years. So... Um, key thing to focus on here is this whole question of uh, deficit spending and, and debt. And I'm just going to show you a few slides about this and wrap up on this, on this note. Um, what you see here on the left is the government deficit or the government surplus each fiscal year as a percentage of the GDP. So as you can see, we were running deficits all through the 1980s when, um, when Reagan and Bush were president. And then look at those surpluses. When Bill Clinton, by the time Bill Clinton left office, Democrat Bill Clinton, we had a government surplus. The next president, um, Bush, ran up gigantic deficits uh, by, through wars, very costly wars. Uh, but it was getting back under control when the economy crashed. And then we had to run huge deficits to, to begin getting out of the, uh, under President Obama, to get out of the, the um, recession. Uh, and, you know, it goes up and down. So we are, for the most part, in the red. That almost every year, because of tax cuts on the rich, wars and military spending, the cost of medical care and prescription drugs, and then paying interest on the money we've already borrowed to finance these deficits, we tend to, the government budget tends to run uh, deficits every year. And those things added up, they create a debt. And so here's the uh, the debt as of uh, March 2nd, 2022, you can see this is from the Federal Reserve. Uh, it's $29 trillion. That sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? Well, you know why? Because it is. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you something about this chart. I've circled a couple of things I want you to look at. First, there's the total amount, $29 trillion. Now, notice how the deficit shot up in the last two recessions. You see the Great Recession? You see how the, the indebtedness shot up? We borrowed money to stimulate the economy, to get us out of the, get the economy out of the recession. Same thing happened in the COVID-induced re recession. That is the second one that's, that's uh, circled. But now let's ask another question. How big is that debt really? Let, be, uh, that's the total debt. That sounds like a lot. Well, it is a lot of money. 29 trillion is a lot of money. No question about it. But how does it match the uh, size of the economy? If you think about that 29 trillion as a percent of the gross domestic product every year, now, for a long time, you see the line where 100 exists, there is 100%. That would, that's the size of the, uh, that is, would mean that the amount we have borrowed is exactly equivalent to the gross domestic product. So if we, if we owe 29 trillion, uh, let's, or let's go back, let's go back to, let's say, approximately uh, 2012. You can see in that era, there was a period where the, um, the, total debt that we owed was almost exactly the same as the amount the economy produced every year. But then with COVID, it shot up again. And I'm going to show you what I circled here. Again, what we did here was we borrowed a lot of money to get us out of the uh, recession. And now uh, that percentage is going down because the economy is productive again. The economy is getting bigger. And so that total amount of debt uh, is a slightly lower percentage. It, now, we're still now 
borrowing more. We owe, we owe more in total debt than, the, than our annual GDP, but they want to, it's going in the right direction. We are hopefully headed back down, uh, and that can be done with the correct policies. Uh, we probably have to increase taxes on the wealthy and reduce certain types of expenditures, like the amount of money we spend on health care at the federal level. But that is, these are matters we can take up in uh, the second of our um, uh, videos, which is coming up. So thanks for your attention.